Okay, so hello boys, hello girls. Today we're going to see a very, very simple topic, but that you need to understand really well, really well because it has its very deep areas. <clears throat> Sorry. So please pay a lot of attention, copy what I'm going to tell you in your notebook, and you're going to have to do an activity with this, but this is going to be the last activity that I'm going to ask you to do for history for this part of the trimester, for this first part of the trimester. After that, <clears throat> well, we're going to have a, a bit of a review so we can be sure that you understood all these first topics that are related to, well, to theory in history, how um, history as a science has some very important elements that are theoretical elements that are used in order to make history, to write history. So this is the last of those topics and uh, you will have to do an activity, but it will be very simple and it will be the last one. Uh, so the topic is sources for history. What are sources for history? Well, <clears throat> remember that we need to uh, take our, our information from somewhere. Like we have already said that history is not just about repeating the facts, is not about the dates, it is about studying processes. But where do I get my information in order to analyze processes, in order to propose as a hypothesis that the transformations of, of certain century or whatever were as I am saying that they were? <clears throat> well, those are precisely the sources. However, let's go to the, main, uh, to the main area of this topic. It is very simple. If we were to classify the sources, we would say that we have basically primary sources, <coughs> secondary so sources, and both of them can be either direct or indirect sources. So we can have a primary source that is an indirect source. We can have a primary source that is a direct source. We can have a secondary source that is an indirect source. Or we can have a secondary source that is a direct source. Usually secondary sources will be direct sources, but many times they won't. So we can actually find direct uh, secondary sources that are indirect sources. And perhaps you won't believe this, but, well, the favorite sources for history making are primary sources, of course, we're going to see what those are. But perhaps this will be a bit of a surprise, but the um, favorite sources, primary sources for history, even if they are secondary sources, will be the indirect sources. Indirect sources are going to be the favorite sources for historians, and we're going to be seeing why. Like if you're able to have a primary source that is also an indirect source, you have a treasure in your hands. <clears throat> but what are primary and secondary sources? Let's start by there. <clears throat> let's start over there, sorry. And let's start by opposing these ideas. Like what is a primary source as opposed to a secondary source? So a primary source is a source that was written around the same date of the thing that we are studying. Uh, for example, if I am studying the 16th century, this document very clearly comes from the 16th century. So this is a <clears throat> primary source because it is from the same century that I am studying. It comes from the same years. <clears throat> and if I have a secondary source, this is a source that was written <clears throat> or was produced after what we are studying. For example, over here we have a 16th century document, but over here we have a book that was written in the 20th or 21st century that is talking about Mexico City in the 16th century, from the 16th to the 19th century. So this is a secondary source, why? Because even if they are both talking about the 16th century, this one over here was actually written in the 16th century. That's what makes it a primary source. But this one over here was written uh, perhaps on the 20th or, um, or in the 21st century. So that's what makes it a secondary source because it isn't of the same date from the events or processes that we are talking about. <clears throat> now, direct sources. Direct sources are sources that have the intention to leave a testimony behind. Like they are written for history. The intention of the author is to leave a testimony in history about what they are talking about. So in this case, I am including you this example. Historia verdadera de la conquista de la Nueva España by Bernal Díaz del Castillo. 
So this guy actually was with Hernán Cortés when the conquest of Mexico took place. He was a soldier in the company of Hernán Cortés. And he wrote this book when he was older, like he was already living in Spain in his last years. And he decided to write this book um, because he wanted people to remember all the battles that he had, all the successes that he had. He wanted people in the future to remember his struggle, to take him into consideration. He wanted to tell his own side of the story. Because we, of course, have documents of these years written by Hernán Cortés. But this guy was like, no, I, I, do not say, I do not think the same things as Hernán Cortés. I remember differently. So he wrote this book trying to give his side of the story. And, well, it is mostly a primary source because it was written uh, more or less in the 16th century, by the end of the 16th century, and it talks about the conquest. So the conquest took place in the 16th century. So it is more or less a, a primary source. Um, many people that want to be very precise actually treat it as a secondary source because it was written like 30 years after the conquest. So it wasn't so close. <clears throat> so depending on how precise you want to be, uh, you may say that it is a primary or a secondary source. But it is more certainly a direct source. Because Bernal Diaz actually wanted to leave this testimony for history. Like every time a historian takes this book and reads it and uses it in order to write history, he's doing exactly what Bernal Diaz del Castillo wanted him to do. Use this as a testimony for history. So, as opposed to direct sources, indirect sources are sources that leave testimony without the intention to do so. Like the author wasn't thinking, oh, I am going to leave this testimony for future historians. I am going to leave this information so other people can read it in the future. That is not the intention. They leave information for us, but they didn't mean to. So, for example, letters. When you are writing letters, like to your boyfriend or whatever, your girlfriend, your intention is not that some historian in 100 years uh, reads your, your love letters. It is not your intention. But perhaps some historian is going to do it. And he's going to be able to get some information from your letters about the past. And he will use it. So why do we actually prefer the indirect sources? Well, <clears throat> because as direct sources are intended, they are really trying to leave this testimony to the future. They are also trying to give you a side of the story. They are trying to leave a way, um, they are trying to choose a way of understanding the events for you. Like they are going to, to decide for you what they want you to think. So they are going to tell you the, the story as they want you to know the story. And in the indirect sources, they are not trying to, 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 to leave a testimony for the future, right? So they are not going to be changing events so much. They are not going to be picking sides so much because they are not trying to leave this testimony for the future. They are just writing to their friends or whatever. <clears throat> so in a direct source, there is always going to be a big issue with this thing about how reliable the information actually is. Because whomever wrote this information for the future wants you to remember these events in a certain way. And perhaps that is not the truth. Perhaps he's hiding some things. Perhaps he's changing some things. So how reliable is that information? Uh, how reliable that information really is, right? Because <clears throat> he may be changing a lot of things because he wants you to remember things as he wants. And in an indirect source, well, they are most likely not changing many things because they are not thinking that this is going to be read in the future. They are just writing something. So I am using here <clears throat> this book, Anahuac o México y los Mexicanos Antiguos y Modernos, by Edward Burnett Taylor. He was a great anthropologist that came to Mexico in the 19th century. So um, the country was a free country for like, for like 50 years before Taylor came. Like Mexico <clears throat> had become an independent nation like just 50 years before um, Taylor arrived to Mexico. 
So this is very, very, uh, a very, very young nation when Taylor came. And that is why it is really interesting because you have the eyes of an anthropologist studying the birth of this nation that is Mexico today, right? <clears throat> so I am going to read you a small piece because um, we may think that this is actually a direct source. Why? Because he's trying to tell you what he saw. That is his intention, to write a book about what he saw in Mexico. But in one of his journeys, he's actually going to give us some details that we may be sure that <clears throat> didn't quite have the intention of leaving a testimony behind. It is just like a very brief passage that actually gives us very, very nice information about an unrelated topic, but that is very interesting. So allow me, allow me to read to you. It says, so it says, La mañana siguiente se nos pegó un monje en calidad de Cicerone, un joven muy apuesto con una linda cara y lleno de chistes y buen humor. Ahora vimos el convento a la luz del día y nos impresionó su hermosura y su ubicación. El valle amplio y fértil se vuelve más angosto hasta convertirse en un paso entre las montañas. Y es donde está construido el convento, con un arroyo que baja de las montañas y atraviesa sus hermosos jardines, moviendo la rueda del molino del convento. Antes de perderse en la planicie donde irriga las amplias tierras de los padres reverendos. Cuando hubimos visitado los jardines y los establos, nuestro joven monje nos llevó de vuelta a la iglesia grande del convento, donde nos instalamos junto con los monjes que estaban para presenciar la danza. Llegó la música y un hombre anciano con un arpa y una mujer con un violín. Y luego llegaron los danzantes, ocho muchachos indios vestidos con túnicas cortas y penachos de plumas, e igual número de muchachas en vestidos blancos y con guirnaldas de flores en el cabello. Era evidente que los atuendos tenían que representar la vestimenta india en los días de Moctezuma, pero era una versión un tanto modernizada por la necesidad de acomodar varias prendas que hubieran sobrado en aquellos tiempos. Se pararon en el centro de la iglesia, frente al altar alto, y para nuestra enorme sorpresa empezaron a bailar una polca. Seguía un vals, luego un escocés y después otro vals, y finalmente una cuadrilla, todo arreglado en tonos inconfundiblemente ingleses. Bailaron extremadamente bien y, sopor y se portaron como si hubieran pasado toda su vida en salones de baile en Europa. Los espectadores los miraron como si fuera un asunto tan natural que aquellos muchachos y muchachas cobrizos hubieran alcanzado tal perfección en este pueblo perdido entre las montañas. Y nosotros miramos en un estado de extremo asombro. Y cuando, en medio de la cuadrilla, el arpa y el violín empezaron a tocar nada menos que el rey de las islas caníbales, difícilmente resistimos la tentación a irrumpir en carcajadas sonantes. Sin embargo, nos controlamos y nos quedamos tan graves y serios como los demás espectadores, quienes no tenían la más mínima noción de que algo curioso estaba sucediendo. La cuadrilla terminó en perfecto orden y cada danzante tomó la mano de su pareja para llevarla adelante. Así, formando una línea frente al altar, todos se hincaron y los demás miembros de la congregación siguieron su ejemplo. Durante el espacio aproximado de un ave maría hubo un profundo silencio en la iglesia. Luego se levantaron todos y se acabó la ceremonia. So, uh, as I was telling you, this guy, Taylor, is trying to tell you uh, about his journeys in Mexico. He had to come here from England because he was sick. Uh, so his doctor told him that a tropical weather would make him well, that, that would help him in his health. Uh, so he came here as an anthropologist, actually the first anthropologist ever. He is the first anthropologist that ever existed. And he started to talk about everything that he saw in Mexico. Uh, But this very, very small passage, it is like two paragraphs, are actually talking about something that he wasn't studying, right? He was just uh, in this church. He was someone that was invited to spend some days in this church. And just by chance, these people came here and started a dance. But uh, what I didn't read to you is that the kind of dances that he's talking about are these dances. The ones that we usually see 
like in Zocalo or in some places around this country and that they say that they are pre-Hispanic dances. Well, they are actually not quite pre-Hispanic. And if you remember what I told you, this, uh, this book is very, very old. Like it is talking about the first years of independence of Mexico. This is the 19th century. So we are talking about the 1800s, right? And what Taylor is describing is this kind of music. If you remember, he says, and suddenly we heard that they started dancing El Rey de las Islas Caníbales, and we started to laugh. Why? Because they are supposed to be acting these uh, pre-Hispanic dances, and what they chose as a music was this. and so on, you get the idea. But usually when we hear and we see these type of dances, what we hear is this, right? Like what we hear are a lot of drums and it is very dramatic, right? If you have ever seen this, it is very, very dramatic. But what's the point here? Well, this book that I read to you is actually one of the very few sources that we have in order to talk about these dances really, really far away in time, like in the, eight, in the 19th century, in the 1800s, like again, when the country had just become an independent country. And of course, if you talk to these people, to these dancers, they are going to tell you that their dances are pre-Hispanic, that they follow a tradition, and that this tradition dates the 16th century, perhaps, or that this tradition comes from Mexicas, actually. And that is actually not the case. These type of dances uh, in history have tried to mimic the idea that they have about Aztecs, about Mexicas. So back in the 19th century, what they thought that the Mexicas would dance would be these court dances, right? Like what they heard from um, the sailors that came from England and then came, that came from Spain. Uh, that is what they thought that music would be like in the 16th century. So nowadays, these people believe that the music that Mexicas would dance back in those days, in the 16th century, would be a lot of drums, right? Like... But of course, none of them are correct. Um, never believe these guys, like never believe these guys because they are always going to tell you that they have the ancient knowledge and that they have the tradition that was passed from their grandparents. And you now have proof, this is actual proof that uh, that is actually not the case. Like it has nothing to do with the to what these guys are telling you nowadays. So whenever they try to sell you these dances as pre-Hispanic dances, you can tell them, well, actually, did you know that in the 19th century, what uh, your forefathers would dance is actually a polk, like the king of the cannibal islands? Do you, do you even know that? Is that really the tradition that you are saying that you have? And of course, they won't even know what to tell you. And they will tell you that you are lying, of course. So uh, in here, you have a very nice example about an indirect source. Why? Because Taylor was certainly not trying to leave some information about the Mexica dances for the future, because he knew that in the future, the dancers are going to tell you that the, the drums and that this is an ancient tradition from the Mexica times. He didn't know that he wasn't leaving that testimony with the intention to contrast these dances with the dances that we see today. He was just telling you about his journey and he just um, gives you this detail, this piece of information, because it seems funny for him, right? It's like, oh, and by the way, uh, sorry about that. 
that sign. Um, and but by the way, did you know that I saw them dance the King of the Cannibal Islands? So there wasn't a real intention in leaving that piece of information. It was just something funny that he intended to, to include in his memories. So that is why it is an indirect source. But it is a really good source for us because we can know that the stories that these guys are going to tell you are actually really, really false. And that this is just a pantomime, that this is just a theater, but it is not history at all. Whatever they, these guys tell you is not history at all. And believe me, I know, I have studied this a lot. So uh, I hope that you now understand the difference between direct, indirect, primar primary and secondary sources. But there is actually one more thing that I need to read to you. And this is what Mr. Mark Bloch uh, wrote about sources in his book, the book that he wrote in the concentration camp. And, well, this is, has a lot to do with what I have already told you. But pay a lot of attention because this may very well come in your exam and I do believe that it will. So it says, ahora bien, las fuentes narrativas, para usar el francés algo barroco de la expresión consagrada, es decir, los relatos deliberadamente de destinados a informar a los lectores, no han dejado, por cierto, de prestar una valiosa ayuda al investigador. Entre otras ventajas, son por lo general las únicas que proporcionan un marco cronológico algo serio. ¿Qué no darían el prehistoriador o el historiador de la India por disponer de un heródoto? Pero que no quepa duda alguna en la segunda categoría de testimonios. En los testigos involuntarios es donde la investigación histórica a lo largo de sus avances ha depositado cada vez más su confianza. Comparen la historia romana tal y como escribí, la escribía Rolín o incluso Nirbur con la que propone cualquier manual contemporáneo. La primera extraía la mayor parte de su sustancia de Tito Livio, suetonio o floro, mientras que la segunda se construía en gran parte a golpe de inscripciones, papiros y monedas. Solo así se han podido reconstruir trozos enteros del pasado. Toda la prehistoria, casi toda la historia económica, casi toda la historia de las estructuras sociales. Y hasta en el presente, ¿quién de nosotros no preferiría tener entre sus manos algunas piezas secretas de las cancillerías, algunos informes confidenciales de jefes militares, en vez de todos los periódicos de 1938 o 1939? No es que los documentos de este tipo estén más que otros exentos de error o mentira, no faltan las bulas falsas, no todas las relaciones de embajadores dicen la verdad, ni tampoco las cartas comerciales. Pero si existe alguna deformación, al menos esta no ha sido concebida especialmente para la posteridad. Sobre todo, esos indicios que el pasado deja caer sin premeditación a lo largo de su camino no nos permiten suplir únicamente los relatos cuando estos faltan o controlarlos si su veracidad es dudosa alejan de nuestros estudios un peligro más mortal que la ignorancia o la inexactitud, el de la esclerosis irremediable. Sin su ayuda, en efecto, no veríamos inevitablemente al historiador cada vez que estudia a las generaciones desaparecidas volverse de inmediato preso de los prejuicios, de las falsas prudencias, de las miopías que habían afectado la visión misma de esas generaciones, ¿No veríamos, por ejemplo, al medievalista conceder una mínima importancia al movimiento comunal con el pretexto de que los escritores de la Edad Media eran poco propensos al respecto o desdeñar los grandes impulsos de la vida religiosa por la simple razón que ocupan en la vida narrativa de la época mucho menos espacio que la guerra de los varones? En una palabra, ¿no veríamos a la historia, para retomar una antítesis muy apreciada por Michelet, ¿Dejar de ser la exploradora cada vez más atrevida de las edades pasadas y convertirse en una alumna eterna e inmóvil de sus crónicas? This is actually, um, there is something in between this part and this other part, but they are talking, touching two very important points. What are those points? Well, as we were saying, Mark Block, Mark Block is telling us here. Our favorite types of sources are not the direct sources, the sources that are trying to leave some, some testimony. They are the, the sources that weren't trying to give us um, that weren't trying to give us information for the future. And why? He's actually adding another thing here. It is not only because perhaps the intention behind the direct sources is uh, has lie behind them. It is not only because the direct sources may be lying. 
but also because, well, if we wouldn't use indirect sources, then what could we actually say as historians? We could only repeat what those guys already said, right? So there, will, there would be nothing um, new to say about the past. They would know, there would not be any more interpretations. We wouldn't have any more ideas, new ideas about the past. We are able to write more and more ideas about the past. We are able to research a lot more about the past because we can use indirect sources. So if we would limit ourselves to only use direct sources, uh, we would only be able to repeat what those guys already said. We are able to say more, to research more problems, to try to have new questions because we also can use indirect sources. Sources that didn't have the intention to leave a testimony behind, but that they, however, did. They actually left testimony, but they weren't trying to. So perhaps coins, a shoe, uh, a piece of, um, of building, any of those can be indirect sources, right? So they allow us to have more information. And the second part that I read here, that is actually a piece of another page, it is very, very important, this, this part mainly. Um, porque los textos o los documentos arqueológicos, aun los que aparentemente son más claros y más fáciles, solo hablan cuando uno sabe interrogarlos. Antes de Boucher de Perthes, abundaban los sílex como hoy en día en las tierras de aluvión del Soma, pero faltaba quien interrogara y no había prehistoria. Como viejo medievalista que soy, confieso no conocer lectura más atractiva que la de un cartulario. Y es que sé más o menos qué preguntarle. En cambio, una compilación de inscripciones romanas me dice poco. Mal que bien puedo leerlas, pero no sé qué solicitarlas. En otros términos, cualquier investigación histórica supone, desde sus primeros pasos, que la encuesta tenga ya una dirección. Um, more importantly that, uh, than what he said in his, last, uh, in his last phrase, the most important part here is that sources do not exist. And please remember this, sources do not exist. A source only starts existing when you ask it a question, when you make it a source. We build sources. Sources do not exist. Like I can have the best uh, book of history of Rome and it will not be a source. It will only become a source when I build it as a source. And the way that we have in order to build sources, to make sources uh, out of objects or out of texts, is asking questions to it. Once we ask questions to certain object or to certain book, that is what is going to be turning it into a source. But before that, it is just an object. What makes an object or a piece of information a source for history is the questions that we ask it. Uh, the fact that we are able to subtract some information for our research out of this object, that is what makes it a source. Before that moment, it is just a piece of reality. Okay, boys and girls, so I hope this was uh, as clear as possible. I think it was a bit longer than I, than I was expecting, but I hope that uh, you were able to understand everything, yes? So thank you very much. And I will let you know the activity that you have to do. Actually, I will uh, tell you in advance, all you have to do is find sources around you, like uh, try to take pictures about the sources that you may find. Uh, perhaps you can, I, I don't know, use some newspapers, whatever. I will write with more detail the homework in Teams. Uh, but I would like you to use a collage between um, primary, secondary, direct, indirect sources, like all the sources that you may find, make a collage out of them and then just write an explanation on why are those pieces of, of things or images that you chose a source for history and what kind of sources they are. Yes, boys and girls, so thank you and bye.